This training video is brought to you by K-Alliance. K-Alliance provides high-quality instructor-led training videos for desktop, IT and soft skills. Visit us online at www.kalliance.com to sign up for your free seven-day trial. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching and we hope you learned something new. Real videos, real learning, real success. So what I want to do right now is diagram for you this concept of a public versus a private cloud. So in both cases, we are going to have systems on our own corporate network. Now this is going to represent sort of the cloud, the, uh, the internet, essentially. So this is a boundary between the internet and our own corporate network. Now on our corporate network, we have our clients, our client systems, that are the systems that we need to hook into various different services. What are those services? Well, that will just depend. It could be email services. It could be um, other types of communication services. It could be a line of business application service. Either way, the client, this would be something like a Windows 7 client or Windows 8 client. It could be a web-based client. You know, whatever it is, these are our end users and they are on your corporate network. Okay, now, there are servers in your data center that provide various different services, right? So some can be a database server, some could be uh, something like an email server. Certainly, you probably on your corporate network have some Active Directory servers, and this is what your systems, your clients, actually log into. So there's connectivity already on your corporate network to these various different services. This is traditional computing model. Now, we have this concept of a cloud. Certain services, let's say it's a line of business application service that we want to put into the cloud. What is a line of business application? Well, a line of business application might be something that has a web front end, some sort of application logic like a Java-based uh, website. It could be, if it's in the Windows world, it would be IIS and uh, ASP.NET based application. Connected to that line of business application front end would be some sort of middle tier logic application. Again, perhaps Java, perhaps .NET. And then behind that would be some sort of a database that is holding the data for this web application. And your clients are configured to connect just via a browser, maybe, maybe based on some sort of a client-based application that makes uh, web calls underneath in order to connect to these web services. So that's very traditional, uh, meaning that I've got some sort of a web-based uh, service, and then it connects to databases and so on. Now, in a cloud model, I would take that entire application, and I would be able to deploy it multiple times over very easily. So let's say I duplicate myself, and I've got these three servers happening here again but for a different purpose. So web front end connected to middle tier application and connected to a, its own database. So I've essentially duplicated the application, the functionality, the purpose of the application, but for somebody else. So here is now another set of clients that we have out on our network, probably from a different business unit. Let me go ahead and just throw that in there, business unit. Right? So my business units in the banking world that I come out of would be things like an investment banking division versus a retail division versus a uh, fixed income or a private wealth management division. So different business units within your organization. Each business unit or set of clients may have a different uh, need for the exact same application, but we're not going to give them the same servers. So what they're going to do, if this were a cloud model, is they're going to essentially sign up or subscribe. They become a subscriber for a service. The service is this particular line of business application, let's say. Now the service could be anything. The service could be email. It could be uh, some other type of database application. It could be SharePoint. Lots of different services. For now, I'm just focused on the concept of this very specific service that we've created and made available in our data center. 
So if this business unit and sets of clients have subscribed, then we need to slice off and create for them a web front end, a middle tier, and a corresponding database system, and then make it available to them. The other clients from the other business unit also have access to a different web front end, middle tier, and database. Now, in the private cloud, these would just be servers existing in our own data center that we are making available to our end users and to our business units. Now, we're going to come back to that in a moment. The public cloud takes the same concept and says, well, why don't we take those services like the web front end server, even the middle tier application, and even the database, and deploy them out to some sort of hosted solution, and then give our clients access to it via the internet. So some sort of a connection over the internet and the public cloud hosting provider is going to host those servers and those services for us. Now there's a lot of different ways that the uh, public cloud provider, the service provider, could host them. You know, they're probably running as virtual machines. Uh, they could just simply be running as applications on a shared machine. Uh, or they could be a dedicated virtual machine. It depends on what you're paying for, but you're going to pay for the more resource they give you, the more you pay. So depending on how much memory this middle tier application needs, or how much network bandwidth the front end needs, how much storage the back end database needs, whatever it is, you pay for. Now, in a public cloud, now it's not just my company that might be subscribing to these services. It's going to be many different companies, and we refer to them as tenants. Uh, so I'm a tenant or a subscriber, and I'm paying, but I'm sort of sharing much of the resource. This database is probably s stored in a massive storage array in the hosting provider's data center that is shared with databases that are stored for other companies. So it's kind of a trade-off, but they are going to be responsible for the backing up of that data, the high availability of the data, they're going to guarantee a level of uptime. Now, shifting it back into this concept of a private cloud, what is it that makes it a cloud in our data center instead of simply some servers that our clients have access to? It really comes down to how accessible and how dynamically deployable are these services. So in a cloud environment, I'm going to have some sort of sets of uh, cloud servers. I'm being very generic on purpose. Uh, the actual technology in the Windows world would be System Center VMM, or Virtual Machine Manager, that allows me to create these services to define the elements that make up the database. I define on the cloud server the thing that makes up the middle tier application. I define on the cloud server, the thing that makes up the web front end. And then what I can do is at the click of a button over here on the cloud server, I can say, hey, there's another business unit that wants that exact service. Go, deploy it. Click of a button because we've predefined all of these elements. And it will dynamically push out to my Hyper-V servers or my VMware servers, wherever I host my machines, it's going to dynamically push out virtual machines for each level of this particular application. Web front end, middle tier, and a database server. Dynamically creating the virtual machines for me, starting them up, configuring them through scripts that are pre-configured so that they join the domain and that they load up the proper application code. Because remember, in my cloud, I may have many different types of applications. This business unit here has simply subscribed to a very specific application service, okay, this particular line of business. So when we deploy, we got to make sure we're running the correct scripts to set up the correct uh, web application and the correct database components that are necessary for that particular app. Now, as a subscriber or otherwise known as a tenant, I can then come along and say, I would like another application. Okay, maybe a different one that's defined in the cloud server. So they're going to make a request to the cloud service and check a box, press a button, and it will dynamically 
configure the service for us. Now there's other elements that we can put in here as a part of our cloud servers that allow us to tie it all to a cost center. So internally within our organization, we can um, allow that business unit to subscribe, but also have a cost associated with it. So they can make intelligent decisions about what it is they're paying for. The cost will be based on probably how many virtual machines we're deploying, how much storage they're going to take up, how much uh, memory and CPU resource they need. Now, all of these systems are running on Hyper-V hosts behind the scenes. And so, you know, or potentially VMware hosts, but sticking with the Microsoft suite, Hyper-V hosts, and so we're running all these different virtual machines, and the Hyper-V host architecture would be set up in such a way to allow for high availability of these services. Because your business unit owners are going to expect a certain level of service. In fact, even in a private cloud, if you're the data center administrator providing these cloud services, odds are you're going to be signing service level agreements to guarantee a level of uptime for the business unit owners. What is the alternative? The alternative is that the business unit owner would not come subscribe to your cloud. They would just go and provision and buy their own servers and build out their own uh, applications to meet their needs. But what we're trying to do here is provide maybe a more cost effective and uh, a level of service, availability, backup, all the different components that, they, that they're going to need but instead of using their own IT within their business unit, they're going to call upon the cloud administrators to build this for them. So there's a lot of different elements in here that need to be built and configured, and we're going to be looking at a lot of them as we go along. But uh, these cloud services right over here, or cloud servers, the primary components we'll be working with are VMM and System Center Service Manager. Those are two of the main elements. Now, there are other elements like System Center Orchestrator, uh, System Center Operations Manager for sort of monitoring the whole environment so that as the, the cloud administrator, I can know what's happening. Uh, data Protection Manager for backing up all these databases and all of these virtual machines. So all of these products work together to provide this private cloud uh, infrastructure. So cloud is a big buzzword these days. And you can either go public and put things into Windows Azure uh, or into third-party hosting providers who will give you a lot of resource and a lot of bang for the buck, but you're paying a fixed price. Here, a business unit now can pay a fixed price, but we pull it back into our own data center. So we're not sharing anything with other companies. Uh, we might consider it more secure. We might consider it a little bit more flexible. One of the biggest benefits of building your own cloud instead of going public is that we have full flexibility to build exactly what we need, as opposed to maybe in the public cloud, we might be limited to a few options that they give us. So that's my overview of public versus private cloud. We hope you enjoyed this preview video. Please click on the like button below if you did and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Be sure to visit us at www.kalliance.com to sign up for your free seven-day trial today. You could learn a lot in a week.